I think Paige from the community development team might be reaching out to you. So oh, amazing. about some other opportunities we've got going on and we can chat about it next well, at our next sync. So I just wanted to tell you about that. Amazing. So. I love it. You're always there somehow on my side, you know, helping, <laughs> helping even when I'm not there in the room, which is lovely, right? They say your brand is what people say when you're not in the room. So <laughs> Well, you know, Rachel, I adore you and appreciate oh. all the high quality content you're producing for our audience here. So. Yeah, we try. And Pete's going to be amazing because we've got all the juice here, you know, and, you know, we're just both so feeling, you know, ready to support job seekers in a very important time. And we're here for all the things. So, you know, glad to be here, glad to help as much as we can. Perfect. Yeah, I'm gonna jump so, on. Oh, Pete, it's so nice to meet you. I'm going to jump in the audience so you guys can get started here in a couple of minutes. Nice to meet you, okay. Becky. Thank you. All right. Um, I think it's, you know, 201. So I'll give it, you know, 30 more seconds, but I guess I'll get us going. Thanks for all the joiners today. So uh, let's see. All right. I'm going to dive right in. Um, my name is Rachel and I am the founder, CEO and career coach at Woken. And so if I'm counting correctly, this is our 18th time speaking on Fishbowl, but I might have lost count. So uh, you can follow us by clicking on our profiles to be notifi notified of future conversations. Um, and today we are kicking off with a second session as part of a series called Recruiting Unfiltered. And we're going to focus on pulling back the curtain, talking about job applications, hiring processes, helping all the job seekers to navigate your job search. Uh, we're going to talk about second round, third round interviews, what makes for a successful hire, how do interviewers listen and measure your candidates before, during, and after interviews? How do you make it through to the offer? How do you decide whether to take a job? All these important critical questions. Um, so we're gonna run this interview for about 40 minutes and really learn from Pete. Uh, and then we will have that audience Q&A for about 20 minutes at the end. Um, so you can raise your hand at that time to join the stage or you can DM me your questions and we can keep your name anonymous that way. Um, so I will just super quickly introduce who I am and then we'll have Pete give him give an introduction and then we'll dive into the questions. So hello everybody, uh, if we haven't met. Uh, my quick background, I started out in the corporate world. I was at Goldman Sachs and then Bridgewater. Uh, I was in operations and then recruiting and performance management. Um, and I've been career coaching people on the side of my corporate jobs and then eventually full-time got coaching training through NYU, got certified through the International Coach Federation. I also did a tech MBA through NYU Stern and I've done coaching through a variety of organizations, including uh, building my own business now for over six years and really just supporting hundreds of different professionals from a wide array of backgrounds through pretty much all the different types of career goals and challenges you could think of. So I've seen it all, and I know Pete has as well. Um, so Pete, please just give us like a high-level intro to who you are so we have some context. Great. Thanks, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Look forward to answering as many questions as we can. Like Rachel said, I'm Pete Newsom. I'm the president and founder of two companies. One is Four Corner Resources. It's an, we're an 18-year-old staffing company based out of Florida. And about a year and a half ago, after realizing that there was a significant need for career content and advice that really didn't exist anywhere else, my team and I launched a second brand, Zengig, Z-E-N-G-I-G, uh, to do exactly that, to provide career advice, content, and resources. And through that, uh, brand, Rachel and I connected not too long ago, and she invited me to be here today to answer uh, as much as we could. So um, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, amazing. So I'm going to dive right in, and I like to go in some logical, sensical order. And so I want to start at the top of the funnel. And I know today we're going to talk a lot about like the mid funnel and the end of the funnel in terms of interviewing, but I want to just give it a quick moment at the top of the funnel, because I just can't stop hearing enough about people who are struggling in the beginning of the job search process. So, you know, Pete, when you hear somebody say, I'm not landing any interviews, <laughs> what comes to your mind? Like, how are you helping a candidate to just break through in the very beginning, get noticed, get those screener calls. 
how do they get through in that early part of the process? Yeah, it's, it's a really uh, crowded job market in certain areas right now, which is incredibly frustrating for job seekers. It's, an, it's frustrating for recruiters, too, believe it or not, because of how the job search process and application process in particular has evolved. If you're on LinkedIn, then you know what I'm talking about with the one click apply. You can see hundreds, if not thousands of applicants for any role. And it's just a bad I'll call it even a broken system that we have right now. So as a job seeker, my advice is to try to shift the rules in your favor where you can. Sometimes easier said than done, but I'll share a couple of thoughts on this that um, I recommend to my closest friends and family, and it's what I would do if I were on the market right now. And I'll start with the premise that it's better, it's always better to be found if you can. And what I mean by that is, Recruiters want to fill a job as as much as the employees want to, you know, the job seekers want to be found for the job. So start with your LinkedIn profile. And I won't spend too much time on that. There's plenty of documentation on that. I'm sure you guys see it all the time. But recruiters use LinkedIn heavily to find the right person for the job. And, and every recruiter I know would much rather not have to fill a job through someone applying because that's a slow and tedious process. And uh, you just have to sort through a lot of resumes that way. So everyone wins when a recruiter can find a candidate based on their LinkedIn profile or their resume on a job board. So if you don't have your resume on the major boards, and, and, and that's Indeed, Career Builder, Monster, there's a lot of niche boards too. We don't have time to go through those all uh, right now, but some Google searches can show you where those are. Trust me when I say that that's where recruiters want to find candidates uh, compared to applications. And speaking of recruiters, work with them. There's a, a website called clearlyrated.com that I recommend. It is, uh, this is going to date me as the old guy here, but it's uh, like a good housekeeping seal of approval from the old days where this is a, an independent um, uh, surveys that go out to the candidates who've, who've, been, who've worked with and clients of staffing companies. And they rate the, the companies by geography and industry. So clearlyrated.com, search for your local market, search for your industry, and you can find the top rated recruiters in your area. And when, I'm, when I say recruiter, I mean third parties, companies that uh, work on behalf of their clients who uh, ask them to fill jobs on their behalf. These are not companies that charge you as a candidate. If anyone ever does that, that's an entirely different thing, right? That's career coaching. These are staffing and recruiting firms that are paid by the companies that hire them to fill their jobs. And the reason why you want to work with them is because recruiters have ex exposure to jobs that never get published otherwise. It won't get posted online, on a company's website, and recruiters don't wait in queue like everyone else. We have direct access to the company that's hiring. We deliver resumes right to HR, right to hiring managers, one or two at a time. So make connections with local recruiters who work in your space. And if you're looking working nationally, then you can find those companies on um, on clearlyrated.com as well. Another good resource is the American Staffing Association. You know that if a company, a staffing company is listed on there, they operate at a certain standard. So you can see a list of um, American staffing firms on their website as well. And the next thing I'd recommend is leverage your network. And that doesn't mean you have to be close with someone. It doesn't mean you have to be neighbors or friends or family with someone to, um, who works at a company. If you see a job at company XYZ, the first thing I recommend is ask yourself, who do you know that works there? And if you know anyone at all, ask them to deliver your resume on your behalf. Circumvent the application process wherever possible. That's a recurring theme that I always talk about with job seekers. And employees are motivated to do that, even if they don't have uh, a paid employee referral program, which a lot of companies do, employees you know, get, it, it looks good for them to refer great people. So even if you don't know someone well, reach out. If you're a second, third connection on LinkedIn, ask uh, you know, for, for that connection so that person can hand deliver your resume, just like if you're working with a third party recruiter. Wow. But if you have to yeah. apply. Yeah. If you have to, but Rachel, take, cut me off whenever. No, no, no. I'm, this is I'm amazing. I, I can hear all the preparation you've done to synthesize your, your tips. So I want to keep understanding all of them, but this is so good. So I, I want to just follow up um, to clarify. So Pete, um, 
in the beginning when you were saying like those different job boards and i agree there are so many different job boards and i like that variety because you don't want to just be on one you want to have your profile and your resume uploaded to a few different ones and you know space it out you don't need to make anything overwhelming just give yourself a process and maybe once or twice a week you find one other space or platform to be on and what i love about the unique job boards is Oftentimes it's like part of a community, right? There might be a Slack group and an email newsletter and then some job board where it's like really specific to your industry or specific to your type of role. And there's just so many different groups and spaces and places and tools and platforms. So get creative and, and sort of vary up where you physically are. Um, but Pete, just to clarify, were you sort of saying that by having, because this is what I've learned too, is like what, what say whether you apply to things on Indeed or whatever it is, but just having a profile on the different job boards, whether you're sort of doing applications or not, is that kind of what you were saying to make sure your resume is sort of uploaded to have that Correct. profile in a few different places? Correct. You want to have your profile created on these accounts. So we, we talked about the big ones. I forgot to mention ZipRecruiter. That's one of the big ones too. And that's where recruiters will go and proactively search. The, just like you're, you do a keyword search to find the jobs that you're a good fit for, recruiters are doing those same keyword or Boolean searches to find candidates that are a good fit. So the more job boards you have your profile on, and I'm not saying go crazy with that, but uh, the, if you cover the big ones and then if there are some niche ones, in, depending on what your specialty area is, then it should, you should be on those too. A quick point, though, Rachel, on uh, job feeds, right? So the job boards themselves that list all the, the, the jobs that you can source, uh, you can search, this is sort of a dirty little secret that a lot of them are aggregated, meaning if you go on ZipRecruiter, you're seeing jobs from pulled in from a lot of different job boards. So don't think you have to cover your bases by searching on a whole variety of job boards. Any specialty job boards, and I roll my eyes, I have to say, when I see people post a list of 20 job boards on LinkedIn, because they're all sharing the same jobs. So if you just, it's more about having your profile on there, use, uh, use LinkedIn, use Indeed, use ZipRecruiter for your searches, and you will cover 95 plus percent of all the jobs that are listed, um, that are available in the U.S. Amazing. I love it. And then you were also mentioning just chatting with the headhunters and staffing agencies. I, I, I like that because look, I, I, I think as the market changes, you know, that never used to be my number one tip, but I think in today's market, you know, making friends with a recruiter or staffing agency, it absolutely doesn't hurt to balance that into your day and your week. Again, do I think it's going to be your number one thing you're doing all day? Maybe not, but it's absolutely, I would say more a part of what I think a candidate can and should be doing more than in the past. Um, because in today's day and age, you're having that advocate and somebody to get to know you and vouch for you who also has a pulse on the pipeline of open roles that may not be posted right and 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 they're in the business of placing people so you're you're, in, you're aligning incentives which is always good um and you're sort of having like your tentacles out in different spaces and and the beauty of that headhunter call is you can also just have a call with them and you know they've got a lot of tips and they've got a lot of knowledge and maybe does your direction make sense? I mean, you never know. Sometimes those recruiter calls can be like a little career coaching in and of itself to make sure things make sense. They're going to ask you your direction and they may either help you figure that out or they may help you figure out that you're not sure yet where it is you want to go. But, you know, getting ready to have those conversations and tell people where you're at, what you're looking for and getting some tips, those recruiter headhunter conversations can be really, really helpful. And actually, recently, I was doing a chat with um, the career group, which, um, Pete, I'm sure you know the career group. And, um, you know, they, they also were giving a lot of tips behind the scenes. And maybe we can get them on some fishbowl as well. But there's a lot of those, you know, agencies out there, the Michael Page of the world and all those types of things. So definitely making friends and, you know, finding the ones that might specialize in your in your areas as well. It's one of many activities. And then, like Pete said, obviously networking um, and, and, and getting some warm connection, some introduction, leverage your alumni network, try to get on the inside of these companies, try to get your foot in the door. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to sort of quickly pivot to more of like that mid funnel process. Let's talk about the interviews a bit. Um, because I do want to balance the different talks that we have, and we can always come back to the top of funnel because there's so many important elements to break through the barrier of getting the first interview. But once we get that first interview, 
Um, you know, this is just starting really broad. And I know we have like a lot of different elements that we can talk about. But, you know, what stands out to you to make for successful, compelling interviews that could be during the conversation? But also, you know, I think about email etiquette. I think about somebody showing up holistically, uh, ready to succeed in the process. What sort of stands out to you for, you know, somebody succeeding in, in the interview process? Yeah. So let me, coincidentally, Rachel, we just, uh, I just published a blog on Zengig about this. So let me, I'm going to run through the, um, what I consider to be the ways to make a good impression at that initial job interview. But before I do, I, I only covered you know, before the, the things that um, you should do to be found or to have help in your search. But if we have time, I'd like to go back to tips to give yourself a better, uh, to give everyone a better uh, better odds when they do apply. So let's let's put that aside since you want to move on. But there's a lot of things you can do to to stand out in the application process if we have time to get to it. But let's let's move on to the interviews. So first thing, do your research. Research the company. Research the interview. The interviewer. Dress appropriately. Pay attention to manners. The, there, there's so much competition right now. And and look, I, I see some advice out there. Uh, at times from some co- accounts with really big following on social platforms that say things like how you dress and your body language and whether you're on time don't really matter. They shouldn't matter. The, but it, everything matters in an interview. Uh, just like any new relationship, uh, you the person who's interviewing you is assessing everything that happens. Some of it's subconscious, some of it's not. And so you want to put your best foot forward. So that means s- smile. Right. People want to see enthusiasm. And I know that's hard. And some of you are probably rolling your eyes when you're like, this is my, you know, I've, I've been through dozens of interviews. How, how can I uh, you know, keep my motivation up? You got to fight through that. Right. Because every initial interview, it's new. It's a new situation for you to make that new impression. Um, you know, give give a firm handshake if it's in person. Right. These kind of old school things matter to people. and It, uh, it will make you stand out. Um, find common ground. Yeah, that's something that I, I think comes through the research process. If Rachel, you mentioned you know, an alumni association, association earlier. If you uh, have any connection that you can find with someone on their in their LinkedIn profile, a group that you uh, both belong to, interests that they share, uh, that you share with them, look at their posts. Try to find common ground with their interviewers. Those little things can make a difference. Um, be authentic, right? Be be real. Don't try to be gimmicky in your interview. Um, Ask questions. You always want to be prepared with questions going in, and you want to consider what you should be asking as the interview goes on. And we may have more time to talk about that later. Um, and you know, I'll say the last thing is express gratitude, right? And again, that's hard at, at times if you've been through a bunch of interviews, but it can really make a difference when you're competing against everyone else. And and it is a competition, and that may not be uh, the most popular way to phrase it, but. If you view it that way, then naturally you will be inclined to put your best foot forward and give yourself the best chance of success. I love it. I love it. Um, Amazing. Um, So, yeah, again, so many things to think about with the interview. And I agree it is holistic and it is hard to kind of separate the whole mindset of like, this is hard and it can be frustrating. But also when I show up, I need to remember that this person's never met me. And, you know, sometimes what I say with interviews is like, it's like a light switch, meaning you're not going to be fake, but the minute you enter that conversation, you're going to kind of be your best version of yourself. You're going to be focused. You're going to have that smile. You're going to have that energy. We're all humans. We all have ups and downs of emotions. But during that moment, you want to be able to show up as your best self. And then the minute it's over, you can go take a nap or you could do whatever it is you need to do. So, you know, it, it's it's finding your own routines for you know, before, during, before and during the call, and also just getting in the rhythm of practicing on a regular basis, how you're going to show up, because the last thing you want is um, to, uh, you know, show up and be like, I just am out of practice with these interviews. So like, just get in the rhythm of it. And that way, it can help if you do mock interviews, you can, of course, show up feeling like, all right, I know what this is going to feel like. And now I can just focus on saying the things I need to say versus like, oh, this feels so alien and it makes you nervous because it's it's just once in a blue moon. So doing the mock interviews, getting in the rhythm of it is going to help the comfort and the confidence. Um, 
any other kind of do's and don'ts, common mistakes, pitfalls, anything you haven't already touched on in that initial list, Pete, that you want to add? Yeah, I know I was speaking fast, so let me run through a list of those two. And some of this will sound redundant, sort of the inverse of what I said before, but uh, these are things that we've uh, put together over years of seeing great candidates miss out on opportunities for little things. And it's such a frustrating uh, thing for everyone involved when it happens, and, and most of these are very easily avoided just with the little uh, you know, foresight and, and preparation in advance. So arriving late, whether it's virtual or an in-person interview, the old adage that you've probably all heard a million times, right? Early is on time and on time is late. Apply it always to an interview. Dress appropriately. Uh, research the company, right? People who aren't doing that. That's a big miss. Um, not understanding the job description. That happens a surprising amount of times where people look at the job description briefly, and this is natural as you're going through an application, you apply. But if you get that interview, go back to it, look at it in detail, understand everything that's on it. And then I'll compliment that by saying, understand everything that's on your resume. And the rule is, if it's on your resume, you have to be able to speak to it. You mm. have to be able to defend it. And that happens a shockingly amount of time that people don't even know what was on their own resume or what was in a job description for the very job they're interviewing for. Mm. Failing to prepare questions. I touched on that briefly. You always want to show the interviewer that you you came to play and that you're motivated for the job. Um, don't feel you need to dominate the conversation. Right. Find the right pace. Rachel's mentioned mock interviews a couple of times. We could talk about that, too, if, if we want. Um, but find your right pace and, and balance in the conversation. Don't let a mistake throw you off. Everyone makes mistakes. I probably made five of them in the 20 minutes we've been recording or been live right now. Um, but I'm going to plow through. I'm going to carry on. And you have to do that when you're in an interview. And people are OK with that. We talked about being authentic earlier. Everyone screws up. So don't let that throw you off. Don't talk badly about your former employers, no matter how tempting it is to do it. Save that for later. Um, oversharing. Don't do it. Right. So that's where that balance comes in. No one wants to know that the candidate they're interviewing comes with too much drama, even if that exists, even if you're having a tough time in your personal life. The interview is not the time to, to bring that to the forefront. Um, I think that's a good yeah, I can keep that, going, that's but we're, amazing. We're, you know, we're, we, I, I have more on the list, yeah. but, but I'll stop. I don't want to keep. Yeah, I don't know. This is helpful. And like, look, to your point about the drama and stuff like that, there's always a way to practice answering things. They're going to ask you about difficult situations. And guess what? Any difficult situation is a two-way street. So there's going to be a way to talk about a story where you can be honest and you can be clear enough and specific that they understand what happened, but you're also not creating red flags. So again, practice. How does it come out of your mouth? And how is somebody else hearing it? Have another pair of eyes and ears to say, how did you receive that? How did you perceive that? Um, you know, and, and to Pete's point about the making mistakes, like what I always say is just pretend you're like, it's, it's a work meeting, pretend you're meeting with somebody really senior or maybe some special client, you'd be a little more focused, you'd be a little bit more prepared than any other work meeting, but you'd still be yourself. If you didn't understand a question, you'd ask a clarifying question, right? They want to see how you communicate. How do you listen? You know, how do you literally answer a question? How do you grapple with information, right? So being yourself is actually the best possible thing you can do. It also helps you to be honest in what it is that you're saying, because if you're forcing it and telling them what you think they want to hear, then you're probably just saying generic jargon that means nothing. So, you know, the more authentic and specific and meaningful your responses can be, obviously it's going to go way longer than just forcing it and doing some cookie cutter things. They want to know you as a person because you're going to join the team, right? And so, so being your yourself. Um, it's, it's kind of this hard, th this is why we're here talking about it, because it's like this fine balance of be yourself, but sure, like, yes, be polished. Um, but that doesn't mean be fake. And that doesn't mean you need to be on edge. And that doesn't mean you need to be someone you're not. So again, it, it's not easy to kind of find that balance. But I would just really think about who do you typically show up as on your best day at work, or for your most important client meeting, like that's the person who's showing up. 
Um, and you, you put it so well earlier, be, be the best version of yourself. That's the goal. We can all, we can all dress up. We can all dress down. We can all you know, speak with our friends very casually. And sometimes we need to do it formally. So this is that opportunity to understand the environment that you're in, the objective that you're trying to achieve, and then, and then act accordingly. Um, and the other thing is, and this happens, I, I understand why it happens. You know, nerves, nerves come into play, but Stay in the moment as much as you can and listen and then react to to that yeah. individual. You can learn a whole lot more about a situation and about how things are going by listening and yeah. watching the other party's body language than you can by what you're saying or doing. So yeah. try to live in the moment. Think of questions that uh, are based on the conversation that's taking place at, at that time in addition to what you came in prepared to ask. Yeah. Um, and... Um, you know, what I like to do to ground myself is just have pen and paper there. So like you can take notes. I mean, if it's distracting, you don't have to do it. But if they're asking you a question, I like to use that pen and paper to just jot down one or two or three key words that come to my mind, whether I'm regurgitating the questions they ask me, or maybe I'm jotting down the key points I want to make in just a few words. So if you need to ground yourself to focus, sometimes writing you know, could be a, a helpful thing. Or again, just going slower. There are ways of buying time. You can ask a clarifying question. You know, they might have asked something that you interpret and you could answer in one of a multitude of ways. So if you're a dynamic thinker and you're interpreting or analyzing their question, the more comprehensive you're thinking about something, that's what they do want to know because they just want to know how you would approach it on the job, which is, are you really thinking of all the things? So the balance is how to be comprehensive, but also concise, right? This is why we practice. There's, there's, you know, it sounds, you know, it is harder than, you know, we, we let it on to be. And so it deserves the time to really show up properly and just take it with great care. Because I think there's a big difference, you know, Pete, when you notice people not reading the JD or not knowing what's on their resume, like there's such a big difference where you're like constantly applying to so many things, but then the minute there's an interview, you need to like zoom in in such great detail. So the ability to zoom out high level and maybe have that quantity approach, and then the ability to zoom in and really be ultra prepared for the, the person in the situation in front of you. I mean, job search takes this shifting in approach, but you know, don't, don't squander it by, you know, that, that every single interview is worth you showing up fully as, as you would to your best client. Right. Um, so, so I love it. Um, now Pete, when you think about first round, second round, third round, you know, there's different stages. Do you feel that somebody's approach or preparation or mindset should change? I mean, obviously they're going to meet with different people. Things are going to get more technical in the questions, but like anything beyond just what we already know to be true. I mean, as they proceed, you know, should they be changing anything in how they're thinking about the process or is it kind of all the same best practices in your mind? Yeah, it, it, it should change. Your confidence level should certainly change. It should be increased as, as you get invited back. Uh, one of the things that I recommend to every candidate, every situation, if, in, in, as a as a third party recruiter, we want to apply this to everything that we do. Is to understand exactly what the process looks like. What's the timeline? How many people will be involved? Are the you know, how many interviews will take place? When is a decision going to be made? So I think if you better understand that up front from your initial interaction, and, and so if if that is. Uh, an email scheduling the interview and you haven't yet spoken with any from anyone from the uh, from the company, ask them that. Ask them what the process looks like, what you can expect. Of course, do it politely, but the better you understand that, the more you'll know where you stand in, in, in the entire situation. Um, and if you're working with a recruiter, go ahead and ask them that in that initial phone call as well. And then as you get invited back, that's when you can start asking uh, deeper questions that I would avoid in an initial interview. And what I'm referring to are things like, yeah, don't talk about time off. Don't talk about raises. Don't talk about politics. Don't talk about anything that comes anywhere near uh, you know, protected classes in an initial interview. Stay far away from that stuff. Um, and then as you get deeper, that's when you should really consider everything you learned in each initial step and then ask questions based on that. I mean, that's really the best thing I can say to that, Rachel, mm -hmm. is um, I'll remind everyone that you're playing to win and approach it that way. So craft your questions based on everything uh, that you've experienced up until that point. 
Yeah, I love that. And I agree. I think early on in those early interviews, you're asking questions that are strategic questions that show that you're grappling with the work and you're trying to understand you know, their strategy, their roadmap, their pain points, what it is they do, how they do it. And your questions can prove your fit and your knowledge. But by the end of the process, that's where you can really ask what it is you need to know. And I always say you are going to interview them back. You still need to know it's the right fit for you. It is a two way street. But at the end of the process, make them love you, make them, you know, make you an offer. And then you can always ask for another call, whether it's with the recruiter, you can have calls with people outside of the interview process, you can get scrappy and always get comprehensive with the questions you want to ask. But the order of events, right, use your questions wisely in the beginning to showcase, you know, your fit, your knowledge. Um, and how strategic you're already, you know, you're, you should show up like if you're interviewing to be a marketing manager, you should show up as a marketing manager. Your questions are like, I always say your questions should be like as if it's day one on the job. What would you need to know to succeed? That kind of line of questioning is going to show you're thinking really seriously about the role and the work. And it's going to impress them because maybe you're asking the same questions they're asking themselves. And then they're like, oh my God, great. Like this person's like alongside of us. Like they're already like in it. You know, they, they know what are what's important to be thinking about and then yes later on down the line it's like the logistics and the time off and yada 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 right all that yeah there, rachel there was a survey that i read last week that, that uh, was a national i think it actually an international employee survey that said that 38 percent of applicants don't want to work for uh, companies whose views don't align with theirs well, that's that's great. If that's important to you, but you have to get the job offer before you can decline it. So you make a great point that you want to put yourself in position where they want you, and then you can decide whether you want them. And yes, that filling out process happens along the way, but always always get the job offer and then decide whether it's one you want to accept. Now, Rachel, it makes sense. There's a couple of categories that I think about of questions you should ask. Yeah. You want me to run through those real quick? Yes. So yeah, these are basic, and I'll just give you a couple examples of each, but um, these are things that apply in almost every scenario. So first, questions about the job itself. What does a day look like? What qualities do they look for? What does success in the role look like to the company? And then questions about the company itself. People want Some people place great importance on that, and you have to assume the interviewer will. I, I would say most don't, to be quite frank. They care more about soft skills and hard skills and the right personality fit. But every once in a while, I see hiring managers and interviewers who really care about these kind of things. So ask about the company's values and missions. Ask about the company's goals. Ask about the company's culture. Um, training and development, that's important to a lot of people. So ask about the new the, the, the training uh, plan for a, a new hire. Ask what kind of opportunities exist in that area. And then ask about how your success will be evaluated. Right? That shows you're really paying attention to what matters most. Questions like, how will success in this role be measured? Or has a, a company, you know, what process does a company use to evaluate employees' performance? Those are all fair game to ask. And you can ask about the culture. You can ask about the team itself. So those are kind of the, the five, five or six categories that if you have a couple yeah. questions prepared for each, you'll, you'll be in great shape. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, you, you can even go deeper with some of these in the sense of like, the culture question, I like to ask yourself, what element of a company culture do you really look for? And can you ask them to say, tell me about a time, you know, whatever, whatever, and try to actually get them to give you examples so that you can interpret whether they actually exhibit that trait that you're looking for versus, you know, if you ask them about culture, like they may give you a fluffy answer. So how you phrase your questions is so, so, so important as well. Get really creative, get concrete and get stories. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you are going to ask about like success and how it's measured, sometimes when you ask a question, I feel like it can have this subtle, like subconscious implication that you don't know the answer. And it's like, in theory, you want to almost presume that you know what this job is. So sometimes for a certain question, you could say something like, you know, I think A, B, and C would be really critical for this role, but is there anything else that you really keep in mind? Or I wanna make sure I have the full picture on how you measure success beyond what I'm aware of today or something like that. And you show that it's like, here's what I know and here's what I don't know. But you know, that l implication that you're already thinking about it, but you're also saying, look, I don't know how you do this as well, right? So, so there's ways of getting creative, being authentic and 
be specific with how you phrase your questions. Like take everything that Pete's saying and every article we see about the tips of what to ask and then like make it your own, make it make sense to you, make it creative to get what you need out of it. So, you know, every element of, of the process, even the emails that you send and the follow-ups that you send, those are meaningful opportunities to reiterate fit and interest as well. So literally every part of the process should be given great care. And you'd be surprised if you sit there for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes to think about the questions you want to ask them, you're going to come up with way more than you would have if you just give yourself two minutes to prepare. So give yourself the time and space. And maybe you go to a peer or a mentor or a coach and say, how do these sound? Right? So so getting another pair of eyes and ears can go a really long way as well. Um, so, and to, you know, and to your point, yeah. it, it has to sound like you. Yeah. And so even though it, right. so the, the question that it. I would yeah. ask yeah. may not be the question that you would ask. Exactly. Uh, my, yes. my experience is different. My you know, where I, I come from is different professionally and how long I've been in business. And we all, you know, the, so that you start with this sort of an umbrella um, you know, group of things that apply universally, but then you have to figure out what makes the most sense for you. And I just want to say, because I'd be remiss if I didn't, a quick point on that. Chat GPT is a great tool, but don't let that be your voice. Mm. It's really obvious to those who use it a lot. I'm one of them. I use the heck out of it. My team does. But there's some telltale signs when someone is sending something straight out of chat GPT. So use it for outlines, use it for ideas, but don't let it be your voice because it's really obvious and that will, um, yeah, there's an immediate loss of, uh, of respect when someone sends something from chat GPT as their own. Uh, and it's just, it's just more obvious than you realize. So we can move on from that, but I want to, Oh my God, that's quick. such a good reminder. And like, just remember, these things are a tool. They can help you. You can brainstorm. You can get ideas. But then, like, ask yourself the same question that you just asked ChatGPT. Or, like, read the response and then make sure, like, oh, would I add anything to this? It only knows so much and it doesn't know you. So absolutely, I think you phrased it so well. Do not let it be your voice, but let it help you. That's fine. But to be honest, if you're, like, not confident, and that's why you're relying on ChatGPT, you might need more of that mentorship or peer-to-peer -peer support or coaching support. So trusting yourself and understanding what are these tools good for and what are they not, um, it, you're exactly right, Pete. It's so important to think about, like, even for resumes and cover letters, it's like, when and where and how should I use this stuff or not? Because, you know, as much as this is the chicken and the egg, and it's really hard because, yes, you have to do things at some level of volume, but don't, like, hinder yourself because everything is going to look generic. You know, in that case, none of the effort's worth it. So understand how it can help and how it can't. Um, can, I, can I touch on volume yeah, real quick since yeah. you mentioned it? And yeah. This is kind of going back to how we started. And sorry for going back here, but no, I think it's an important point. In part of what I hope to bring to this conversation is the perspective of, of recruiters who look at resumes all day and really do want to fill jobs. And I know the industry and the, the profession sometimes gets a bad rap and is sometimes deserved. But believe me when I say recruiters want candidates who um, – who, who are easy to work with and who are going to uh, to get the job. They want that mutual win. Um, but when, um, when, when you're, if you see a job, so we have this ability to, to mass apply, right? And I already said, it, if you're just joining us, it's an awful system right now, the one click apply. But if you, and so recruiters know because of that, that if they see a hundred applications, 90 of them are not going to be a good fit. Now, a lot of people will say, go ahead and apply anyway, throw your hat in the ring. And yeah, that that's you can do that, but understand that that's kind of what caused the problem. So no one individually is going to solve it, but that you have to identify that and acknowledge that that problem exists. So when you see a job that you really want, if you, if you apply to a bunch of jobs, just maybe you're a fit for, you're not a fit for, but who knows? Yeah, maybe luck will be on your side. I'm not telling you not to do it. What I am telling you to do is focus differently on the jobs that you are an actual great fit for and that you really want and zero in on those. And so you can't go above and beyond on, every, you know, for a hundred jobs that you apply to, but pick that handful out and then do, do things differently. Find a way to contact the, the individual recruiter, send them an email. There's lots of tips and tricks on how you can find company email addresses, connect with them on LinkedIn, even write handwritten notes. Again, you can't do that for 100 jobs, 
but pick out the handful you really uh, you're really really interested in and, and target those. Uh, I agree, and I, and I'm I'm realizing you know even me referring to volume like I I don't even actually recommend like just such a high volume. So I recommend exactly what it is you just said, Pete, which is amazing. You might have 10 target companies at one time. You don't need a list of 100. You need to say, what are like three or five or 10 places I'd love to work and go after them. Or maybe there's a few roles that really stood out to you and get really creative. And maybe part of your day is crafting your portfolio so that when you do reach out to that recruiter, you are sharing your background and visualizing your experience in the best way. So you're you're absolutely right. And I think the the the, the nut of the issue is that there's usually not enough open roles posted online that actually are a strong fit. But that doesn't mean spend your whole day applying for things that aren't a fit. Do networking, host informational chats, do research, join events, join groups, join communities, work on your personal branding, work on your thought leadership, make it quality over quantity. Meet as many people who do the work that you're interested in because there might be unposted open roles. So there's so many other ways to spend your time in a quality strategic way instead of that volume of stuff. Because to your point, if you're doing apps all day, every day, it's like, what are the odds? You know, what percent of those are actually the strongest fit? So the volume of open opportunities to the um, odds and the amount that are strong fit for you, that's what's at odds. And so I think people are just not always informed about how to spend their time. And we think we have to just be online applying all day, every day, but that isn't your only activity. 100%. Great stuff. Amazing. Okay. I'm going to, um, I, I saw a question from the audience and then I did see a hand. Sorry, we, we didn't get to that hand, uh, raised earlier, but feel free to please raise your hand again. And I'm going to read out, I got a question in the chat. And then if there's no other audience questions, we can, um, you know, keep going down our list, Pete, but let me just quickly open it up to see, um, Yes, I'm just seeing a message. It's important to remember the interviews are also for the interviewee. It's a great chance to find out if the company will be a fit for you. Okay, yes. So less of a question, more of a comment. That is wonderful, amazing. Um, okay. And yeah, again, wh whoever was raising your hand earlier, I'm sorry, I, I should have gotten to that earlier, but please do raise your hand at this point going forward for the last 18 minutes. If you have any questions, please do share. But in the meantime, I will keep forging forward. Um, so either raise your hand or DM me if you have a question. Um, so Pete, you know, if somebody says to you, I'm landing a ton of interviews, but no offers, what do you think about? What comes to your head? Well, so you're in good position that you're doing something right on the front end. That's, that's, that's great news because that's where most people are struggling right now who uh, are in the job market. But then you have to consider uh, you know, what's what's going on when you actually get the opportunity to meet in person. And that's where um, sometimes, you know, tough love is needed. We touched a little bit on mock interviews, Rachel. I think that's a great um, thing to leverage. And maybe so if you're if you're looking backwards, you want to you know, do a self-assessment, figure out what went wrong wherever possible. Ask for direct feedback. Now, a lot of companies won't give that um HR considerations it, it will prevent that at times, but ask for that hard feedback because that's what will make you better going forward. And I will tell you, the more serious the candidate is about getting that feedback, um, the, the better opportunity they have to actually receive it. Um, but then I would practice, you know, you're, you have to assume that something's going wrong in that interview process. Find someone you really trust, uh, whether it's someone who's more senior in your profession or, or we all have people in our lives we, we know are better at some things than others. But uh, find someone to practice mock interviews with going forward and, and, and change your outcome. Yeah, it's so true. And I find that like, look, this is a hard journey. Job search is not easy. You are going to learn a lot about yourself and you're going to learn a lot about the world. You're going to learn a lot about people because some people are going to you know, you're in a position where you're sort of having to be judged and assessed in some way. And sometimes it's going to make sense. And sometimes it's going to be fair. And sometimes it's going to make no sense. And you're going to see the gamut and you're going to see people that are so nice. And you're going to see people that don't answer you. And you're going to see everything. <laughs> and so it's going to test your resilience, right? And it's going to teach you a lot about yourself. 
But we have to know what it is we can control, which is our time, our strategy, our approach, and how we get support and how we get guidance. And if you are getting interviews but no offers, I agree with Pete. It's, it's you know, you could think of it like tough love or you could just think of it like self-awareness where you're doing practice. Maybe you're telling stories in a way that someone else doesn't understand. You know, maybe you're sort of leaving out context or maybe you're using internal jargon or maybe you're being too brief or maybe you're being too long-winded or maybe it's the wrong roles entirely or sometimes it's just the gamut of normal expected things that happen you know in job search it is normal it's like dating you know they say it for a reason you're not going to marry everyone you date so you know finding the right timing the right fit the right role the level the tenure that matches with your background and all the good things, it takes a little bit of that time and effort. So it's possible there's no patterns, but if there is a pattern, that's what you wanna look for. Meaning, do you always trip up in this one fashion or is there one thing sticking out to you that you really need support with? So building the self-awareness muscle and and getting, you know, doing the reflection, what do you think went well or not well? I actually have on my website one of the freebie downloadables of like questions you can ask yourself to say, you know, what do I think is going on? And trust yourself a little bit. And of course, get help from someone else as well. Um, but, but you know, this is kind of the hard stuff. We don't always want to look at ourselves. Um, but, but, but this is an opportunity, you know, to, to do that, right? Um, I'm going to keep looking and see what else um, we have here. Because I think something that we were chatting about, Pete, the other day, which is interesting, is, you know, how can somebody manage unrealistic expectations, right? So Pete, like we're trying to strive for something that's aligned. We're trying to strive for something that's a fit. We're trying to strive for a company that aligns with us. But like, how do you know if you're asking for too many things? Like, how do you think about knowing what you want versus like sort of dealing with the offer that's in front of you and like sort of grappling with that? Well, I mean, I think you have to be pragmatic um, about what your value is at any given time. I mean, the, the job market ultimately comes down to supply and demand. And that's something that uh, is kind of a crude way to say it, I guess, but that's, that, that's what it is. It's why you know, surgeons get paid more um, than someone who works in a call center. It's because there's very few people who have the right degree, the, the years of study, the expertise to operate you know, um, on someone versus those who are um, willing to uh, enable to work, you know, in a customer service role. So you have to understand your value in the market. That's the the number one thing. And that that that's it, it's okay if you have to, um, and it, or it should be okay if you are starting out in your career, you're early in your career. You don't have a, a you can't define your value in the market. That's okay. Everyone have most people experience that at some point. The sooner in your career, the better. I'll say, but that's when you have to step aside and really do that self assessment you talked about earlier, Rachel. Is to say, what is my value? Why does someone want to hire me? What can I do that not everyone else can do? And if you struggle to answer that definitively, then you should assume that companies are going to not see that either. Right. in you right if you can't right. answer for yourself so that that's a hard thing and i i you know could talk for hours about career evolution and how people end up where they are and i have a lot of thoughts on that but you have to acknowledge where you are right now in, in the yes. situation and it really does start with understanding the value you can deliver for for um for anyone else yeah i love that and by the way if anybody has questions or doubts or hesitations. I am such a big fan of career exploration. It's actually our forte. So if you don't have clarity on where it is you want to go or where you fit, absolutely take the time to sort through that, do the exploration, do the reflection. And there's ways of structuring that so you actually feel clear and certain about what is a fit for you as your next step. It is so underratedly important. I could talk all day about that. Um, but I love that. So uh, we did get a question actually, Pete. Um, so somebody applied to a role on LinkedIn and they sent a message to a connection on the team. The contact seemed glad to glad and said they would look into it. Can reaching out potentially help with getting an interview? Yeah. So if you missed that part of what we talked about earlier, the first thing you should do when you see a company that you're genuinely interested in is see uh, who you can reach out to to do exactly that. Um, 
A lot of companies have employee referral programs. They pay their employees if they send them great people. Companies love to have internal referrals one way or the other. So um, make those connections. And again, it doesn't have to be someone you know intimately. It can be a second, third connection. But find a way that you can reach out to a person who is already inside that company and ask them to hand deliver your resume. That's what yeah. I mean. Doing yeah, that and is- I think, you know, the thing about this question is, The contact seemed glad and said they would look into it. So this is the thing. You have to ask yourself, what am I asking someone else to do? Sure, you can ask them to forward your resume. But what I actually like to do is try to get on the phone with somebody if they're willing to spare 10, 15, 20 minutes with you because then they get to know you. Then they understand your background. And then maybe you ask them some questions. And then not only can they refer you and put in a good word, but maybe they'd be willing to introduce you to the recruiter or the hiring manager. So it's like, what are you asking? And I always say, if your information's forwarded, you'll probably never see it again. So you just want to be very careful. And look, it's tough. You know, we, we think about how many job seekers are out there and how many professionals might be receiving these questions. So look, if they're willing or able to spend time and chat with you, great. Take whatever you can get, but be very careful about what you ask in the sense of what is going to be the most helpful thing that somebody else can do for me or with me or whatever it is. And by the way, doing that 20 minute call, you might need to learn very deeply about what they're looking for. Maybe you're debating a few different roles and by having informational chats, you are going to narrow in on your fit and your direction, or maybe you're going to learn more about that team or that company or whatever. What can you gain from the time where you're not just forcing it to say, I want to get my foot in the door, but you're actually using that phone call to, to make it a useful time for everyone, right? Yeah, and, um, and just to, you know. not to read too much into the actual phrasing of that, but look into it is uh, ambiguous and open-ended. So right. let the person off the hook if you're asking them. Give them the opportunity to say no and let them know that that's okay versus putting someone in an uncomfortable situation that is easier for them to avoid because you're in a gray area and I'm not sure – you know, what, whether you're going to do it, whether, you know, I, right. when I should follow up. So always right. be definitive and, right. and, and get rid of ambiguity wherever possible. Yes. And then, but, but also people like to help where they can. Right. And, and so it, let them know, it, listen, if this isn't something you're comfortable with, if you're not able to, for whatever reason, no worries, just let me know as soon as possible so I can move on. And yeah, that's and a, that's I, I think they'll look it. into it begs the question of what was the initial outreach message you want like essentially to ask a yes or no question because if something's low i agree like the response is very vague and it's like what are you looking into like what does that mean like are you going to go find the right connection are you going to share my information or are you going to introduce me or none of the above and so to your point pete you absolutely can give the out and be like if you don't have time um no worries uh i understand or if you have any other suggested next steps please let me know what you suggest and maybe they'll just give you their referral link or whatever so like you can give some ideas and you can also say like is it a b or c like what's easiest for you but yes make it specific so it's clear for everybody what's going to happen how can you help me or not um and make it useful because otherwise yeah if you're in the gray area it's like not going to help anyone and and, uh, and just a quick point on referrals being i consider myself largely a career salesperson there's different degrees there's the one that you mentioned can you set up can we meet together can you, you know, hold my hand and walk me right into this person's uh, you know, office. Can we go to lunch together? That's the best case scenario, of course, right? But then go back, backwards from that. Maybe it's, can you just tell me who to, can you make a call on my behalf? Can you send my information to them? Can you tell me who to call? Can I use your name? And then fall back to, if necessary, can you tell me anonymously? And I won't, I won't say where it came from. So it doesn't have to be, you know, I'll, I'll roll out the red carpet for you and we'll walk in together. Some, so anything you can get, just let the person off the hook. That's right. the best way to get to get their help. Yeah, mm-hmm. different options, but being clear and being super specific. Um, I saw another question come in. What if you do everything in above and beyond on what was discussed here today and you still are not landing interviews or offers being ghosted by recruiters, actual HR internal managers? Ooh. So, you know, let me just share my thought on on ghosting. Ghosting to me, you have to have a relationship in advance to be ghosted. 
So lack of response to a job application isn't ghosting. And I'll, and I'll expound on that a little bit. When recruiters get a thousand applications for a job, it is just not feasible to, to look through each of them to do anything more than to give a standard auto reply. Um, I, there's different perspectives on that. Uh, some people say don't even bother with a generic message. Um, I, I could argue either way on that. People like closure, so we, I would generally, genuine, generally say go ahead and, and tell the person when the position's closed. But just to understand, recruiters don't really see that as ghosting because there was never a relationship to begin with. Hmm. The best way you can avoid that, uh, someone dropping off, though, is to always have a specific time frame on anything uh, on, at the end of any interaction. So yeah. if I'm you know, talking to Rachel and we have plans to follow up, she's going to give me feedback, she's going to schedule the next interview, whatever it might be, I want, will always want to ask her, when should I expect to hear from you by? Mm. I need your I need your accountability. And that's that's the easiest way to avoid being ghosted. And then you can hold that person accountable, right? And so they either don't keep their word and then you know all you need to know about them anyway. Right. Um, or they never really had a solid commitment in the first place or never intended to. So always nail someone down um, on this specific action item and when it's going to come next. Yeah, and you know the other thing too is if you're just doing networking for informational chats, when you're sending that outreach for me, I like to make that all about learning and not about jobs. And if you're meeting people who are in your target roles, teams, companies, industries, and just having like professional conversations about the market and what's going on in the world and what's going on in your field and all these great questions just to meet people, um, you know, usually like give or take maybe 50% of those people will answer and respond and be happy to chat with you if, if you have a specific agenda and a goal and a reason of why you want to learn from them. And so if you're not doing networking for the right approach, like to me, if you're not landing interviews or offers like I, and, and, and you're doing everything, I, I don't know how much we like really went into networking and hosting informational chats. But if you're hosting two, three, five, seven, eight, ten you know, networking calls in a given week, which might sound a lot, it depends how much you can handle. And you're learning about no open roles and no one's willing to forward your information and you land zero interviews after having done 10 networking calls, then I would say, are you going after the right roles? But if you're not landing the interviews, I would say, are you doing the networking calls, the informational chats? Are you meeting people like human to human, right? That's what I would think about. So job search is a funnel. You got to ask yourself, am I struggling at the top or the middle? The top means getting your foot in the door. The middle is I'm getting interviews, but no offers, in which case I need to work on my communication. So identify the pattern of your challenges, and then you're going to be able to say, what do I need to do better and differently about this, right? Yeah, and one one thing to consider too for when you're having interviews and if you're struggling with getting calls back or or that's where the process breaks down, one kind of no-brainer thing to look at that I want to recommend is the star um, you know format. If you Rachel, I know you're well familiar with that, so you can Google it. You can look on ZenGig to learn about that. But it's a great way to, in addition to mock interviews, to really refine how you answer and how you uh, approach an interview. So just Google the star interview format or look at our blog on it on Zengig. Absolutely. Yep. Communicating clearly. If you're trying to make it easy for your listener to take away the key message and understand your impact and understand your approach to work and understand your soft skills and how you think about things, but also your hard skills and how you have gotten things done in the past, right? Relevant stories, relevant projects. And are you being clear when you deliver that message? And do you have enough stories in your back pocket? So the STAR method is just the structure for how to tell a story, but absolutely practicing out loud you know, is going to help you understand, you know, how, how am I interviewing and how am I doing? And by the way, there's more to just what you say. It's how you say it, your tone, your pace, your energy, um, things like that. And so doing those mock interviews can be so helpful. Um, we just have a, a few seconds left, so I'm just going to make sure you all know where to find me. And there's always so much more we can talk about. Um, but please find me on LinkedIn, Rachel Surwitz. I always post on there different types of tips. Uh, message me if you have follow-up questions. Um, our website, IamWoken.com. We have a ton of free resources, um, and we always offer a free initial call if you want to chat one-on-one -on -one about how you're doing and how we can help. Um, Pete, where can people find you and get in touch? 
Of course, I'm on LinkedIn too, Pete Newsom. And then if you want to follow us on any of our social channels, we post a lot on YouTube, I, under my channel, as well as Zengig, TikTok. We post everywhere. So we'd love for you to follow us on our social channels uh, on the Zengig account in particular. Um, or follow me. I give career advice every day on TikTok and YouTube. Amazing. I hope this was helpful, guys. And we are going to be back every few weeks with different recruiters here where I'm going to be interviewing them just like Pete and getting other, I love how you said, dirty little secrets. And we're going to get all the secrets and all the juice. So if you have questions, please come back and ask them um, or just find us, you know, online. And we are here and we are happy to help. And we understand this is big and it's important and it's a difficult process, but you totally can and will achieve that success. So just remember, you can control what you can control, which is, you know, the support and the guidance that you do receive throughout this journey. And we are here for you and we will be back on Fishbowl before you know it. So please follow us and come back. Um, we'll be back in a few weeks. All right. Good luck, so take everyone. Care. Rachel, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. All right. Bye, everyone.